John 10, verses 7 through 11. <clears throat> then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who, ever come be, all who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep, sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Lord, we do come to you today, and, and Father, we, we do thank you that first and foremost we can come confident in the blood of Jesus, Lord, not by our own strength, certainly not in our own merit, not because we, we have earned or in any way deserve the right to come before your holy throne, but God, because you in your righteousness and your grace have given your Son that, Lord, you willingly gave yourself to die in our place, that you endured that cross, and that by your death you've taken down that veil of sin which kept us from you, that through faith in you, Lord, that you give us righteousness and boldness to come before your throne. And so, Lord, I pray that first and foremost, we will hold fast to our profession, that we will not be moved from the faith, but Lord, that we will cling to you in all things and walk closely with you, that today in this time together, that we may be challenged by your word, that we may understand it more fully, that, Lord, we may walk in obedience. I do pray for those who are not able to be with us this morning, Lord. You know the various circumstances and ask that you will work and strengthen in each of those needs, that you will give grace, that your word will minister deeply to them today. And Lord, I pray for Bill and his family as they uh, watch her, her come to the end of her life. Lord, I pray that you will give them rich comfort. And Lord, I do pray for her that you will give peace, at the end, Lord, I do not know anything about her spiritual condition, and so I pray especially that if she does not know you as Savior, that here at the end, that she would come to you and trust you. Lord, that you will show your very real presence in that family, showing that you are the God of all comfort, who is able to carry and sustain them through this time of grief. And Lord, that in this as well, others may lift up their eyes to you they may cry out to you for salvation, that they may trust in you for eternal life. And Lord, I do pray for Pastor Laflam and Lord, the problems that he has been having. I, I pray that this procedure this week will be effective. I pray that you'll give strength to him, peace to the family and the church as he, as he goes through this procedure, that it will go smoothly. And again, especially that you will raise him up and renew his strength uh, there. Lord, as well, I'm mindful today of this one in our community who's missing. Uh, Lord, I, I ask that you will, uh, you'll work there, that uh, she may be found and be found safe. Lord, I just ask that you will intervene and show your grace that even in this, it may be a testimony of you and of your working in the lives of those around us. So I pray for her and her safety. And Lord, again, I pray for us and our gathering that we may exalt you, that we may humble ourselves before your word and we may be changed by your word through the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray all this in your precious name. Amen. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus draws on familiar wildlife to illustrate some of his teachings. He mentions moths, sheep, wolves, dogs, pigs, fish, serpents, and birds. And every one of those references is memorable, from moths who eat our earthly treasures to the compassion of a father who would not give an unclean ser serpent to a beloved child. But possibly the most memorable allusion in the Sermon on the Mount is the one before us today. It is that reference to a wolf in sheep's clothing. The picture is so vivid 
And the warning so stark that we apply it in a wide variety of situations to describe someone who acts a certain way for their own gain and for the harm of others. And what Jesus says in Matthew 7, 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by your, their fruits you will know them. Sheep are natural prey for a wolf and are relatively defenseless against wolves. Possibly the greatest challenge for a wolf is getting to the sheep without being discovered. If the sheep flee or if the rams begin to harass the wolf, he's going to have a much harder time getting supper. And so the crafty wolf sits in the edges of the woods and watches the sheep and he thinks. Later that night, while he's prowling around the edge of the pasture, he stumbles across the carcass of an old dead sheep. And an idea leaps into his mind and immediately begins to put it into action. This crafty wolf carefully removes the hide from the dead sheep and, after a little bit of adjustment, dresses himself in the skin of the sheep. In the dawn hours, you know, just when it's getting light enough to see but not light enough to notice any details, the wolf slips out of the woods and he walks up to the sheep, being careful to hide his trot, his dog-like trot. As he moves toward the flock and he reaches the edge of them, the sheep are a little bit unnerved by this strange presence that smells a little bit dangerous but also smells like one of them. As the wolf stays there and kind of begins to slowly slip into their midst, they smell the sheepiness and they begin to accept him as one of their own. And the wolf stays there in their midst as a sheep. A few nights later, one of the sheep disappears. A few nights later, another sheep disappears. And this happens again and again and again. And the wolf stays there with that flock feasting on the sheep until he has finally decimated the entire flock. Jesus could have just said, beware of false prophets. The warning would have been sufficient. But he adds this brilliant picture, makes it very memorable. And at the same time, it tells us much about the nature of false teachers and the danger that they pose to the followers of Jesus. False prophets, false teachers, false preachers, have been around and have troubled the people of God for thousands of years. They were a problem in ancient Israel. Jesus, here in the the Sermon on the Mount, uh, addresses specifically the false prophets of the Pharisees and the scribes. He's already identified them as deceivers who taught lies and as hypocrites who practice religion for the praise of men. And those who followed the teachings of the Pharisees would not find the narrow way to eternal life. These Pharisees were not the first threat to the people of God. They would not be the last. The church today is afflicted by many false teachers. And we trace the history of the church through 2,000 years and we find that from the very beginning... There were false teachers, so that very shortly after the church first formed, there were teachers that began to go out from Jerusalem, claiming to be sent by the apostles, and began to teach a false gospel. And every generation since then 
the church has been troubled by men and women in, the, in its midst who claim to be teachers of God's word, but who are peddlers of lies and are predators devouring the people of God. So I, I suspect nearly everyone here can name at least well-known preacher who lost his ministry because of his wickedness. I am certain that everyone here is familiar with at least one false teacher. And we must, we have to obey this warning of Jesus because of beware of false prophets. We have to be wary because they lurk in the church disguised as Christians and preying on the children of God. And we have to be cautious. We have to be on guard because these frauds are masters of disguise. Jesus doesn't say that they come to you in wolf's clothing. They don't come showing their true identity. Nobody comes into a church telling everyone their plan to ruin lives and preach lies and destroy ministries. Rather, these wolves come in disguising themselves as sheep. They claim to believe the word and to be zealous for the truth. 2 Corinthians 11 says that false apostles and lying ministers transform themselves so that they appear to be apostles of Jesus. They come into the church masquerading as genuine faithful messengers of Jesus. They profess their love for God, their devotion to Scripture, their passion for souls and their concern for the church. They come in and they offer to help, to teach, to take some of the burdens off the pastor, to lead ministry and to get things done. And tragically, many of these false teachers are welcome. And welcomed with open arms because they appear to be just what the church needs. And 2 Corinthians 11 goes on to say that we should not be surprised that false teachers appear like messengers and blessings from God. It says, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose ends will be according to their works. We shouldn't be surprised if false teachers look exactly like a Christian. That's what Scripture tells us, what Jesus warns us, Paul warns us. So those who minister lies, they're not characterized by a cunning look in their eye by being shifty, or by having a devilish smirk on their face. They are skilled, compelling, interesting, engaging, and persuasive. Many false teachers know the Bible well and are able to make biblical arguments for their teachings. False teachers not only blend in with the sheep, they also stand out as a leader among the sheep. They are ones who others want to follow. But their appearance, their charisma, their persuasiveness, their popularity is not evidence of their truthfulness. Their sheepishness is only on the surface, inside They are wolves seeking to devour. And so we have to beware. Teachers of lies masquerade as teachers of truth. And if you're not on guard, you will be taken by their deceits. Now, some false teachers are revealed by their doctrines. Now, Jesus does not mention false doctrine in this warning. So I'm jumping out from the text just a little bit. But I think it's worth a few minutes of our time to consider the danger of those whose teaching is contrary to essential doctrines of the Bible. The fact of the matter is, American Christianity is filled with false doctrine. 
Entire denominations have abandoned themselves to the promotion of the most despicable and godless teachings. And many of the most famous preachers in America are liars and cheats. I know that's a broad statement, but I I stand behind it and I can prove it to you if you want me to. Some Christians are inclined to say, well, these differences of belief don't really matter. As long as we all say we love God and we all say we love others, the differences don't matter. And the New Testament does not agree at all. Second Peter says that false teachers bring in destruction. They bring in destructive teachings and they lead their followers into spiritual bondage. And so what someone teaches, their doctrine matters. We must beware of those who teach false doctrines. And presently, the most pestilential of these pseudo-prophets are the promoters of the prosperity gospel. These are the ones who teach that Jesus died to save people from sin, sickness, and poverty. They declare that if you have enough faith, and speak words of positive confession, then you can prophesy your future and make happen the good things that you desire. And Jesus absolutely never teaches that he came to make the believer's life more comfortable, richer, or healthier. Instead, the New Testament consistently calls the believer to deny self, forsake all, and follow Christ. The New Testament never promises the believer will be rich in this life or that she will be healed of her ailment, ailments on this earth. The errors of these word, faith, name it, and claim it type preachers are severe. They place burdens of faith on men's shoulders that no one is able to bear. They misrepresent God. They make promises which cannot be kept. They teach people to focus on the fleshly and the worldly. And worst of all, they pervert the gospel. They add to the truth of the gospel. They teach that healing and prosperity are integral to the gospel. And in the doing so, they minimize the confession of sin, the plea to Jesus for forgiveness. They minimize God's gift of eternal life to promise unpromised gifts in this life. They give lip service to the gospel, but their teaching and their preaching emphasizes the prosperity. And downplays the gospel. And another common false doctrine in Christianity right now is the ever spreading call to accept all forms of sexuality, especially homosexuality. And to say it's simply any preacher or teacher who declares that some form of homosexual behavior, even if it be a committed, loving, monogamous homosexuality, if anyone teaches that any form of homosexuality is okay, that preacher and teacher is a false teacher. They are to be rejected because they are denying the plain teaching of the Bible. They are promoting behavior which is contrary to the gospel. So the scriptures clearly says immorality, fornication, and homosexuality are behaviors that are contrary. They are opposed to genuine Christianity. The true believer will not live in sexual sin. Those who say otherwise and those who promote immorality are liars leading individuals to eternal damnation and churches to eventual destruction. Now, I I recognize that when we talk about doctrines, there is room for legitimate differences of, of opinion in understanding various biblical teachings. We have a divergence of opinions on matters here. However, certain 
core doctrines of the Bible cannot be denied or altered. And those foundational doctrines affect our understanding of the Bible, God, and of salvation. And they must be affirmed. Anyone who undermines them or denies them is a false teacher. So, for example, if someone denies that Jesus died on the cross in your place, they are a false teacher. If someone denies Jesus is the eternal, uncreated, second person of the Godhead, God the Son, then that person is a false teacher. If someone teaches that you must do something to be saved, they are a false teacher. If someone denies the Bible is the Word of God and is entirely without error, then they are a false teacher. If someone teaches God is not triune, but is one God who has three different appearances, not persons, but appearances, then they are a false teacher. And I could go on. I won't give you the entire list. It's much too long to list. But anyone who denies these essential truths of salvation, God, and Scripture is a false teacher who Paul says in Galatians, we must count as accursed by God. He says, but even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. It's some of the strongest language that Paul uses. We must not accept them. We must not say, well, they say some good things. We'll accept them for the good things. We must reject those who deny the fundamental doctrines. Now, in this passage, Jesus has in view those false teachers whose errors are not immediately obvious. There are many, many false teachers who affirm essential doctrines. You cannot read their statement of faith on their website and know that they are a false teacher just by that. But by their teaching or their manner of ministry, they undermine the truths they say they believe. And so that their ministry ravages the church and ruins Christians. These wolves in sheep's clothing appear good, but they are wicked. And so to help us discern these false teachers, Jesus now switches analogies. Do you know how to tell and identify a wolf masquerading as a sheep? Examine his fruit. He says, you will know them by their fruits. He is talking about identifying now the quality of the tree. The quality of the fruit produced tells us if the tree is good or bad, if the tree is rotten or healthy. So that which is useless, thorns and thistles, do not produce that which is useful, grapes and figs. That which is rotten will not produce something which is healthy. Fig trees were common in Israel in Jesus' day. They're still very common in Israel. And figs are susceptible to a disease which causes the fruit to rot from the inside out. These afflicted figs are inedible, and they will spread the rot to other trees if preventative measures are not taken. And in the early stages of the disease, the tree and the fruit give no outward sign at all of the rot. The only way to discover this disease is to pick a fig, open it up, and examine the inside of the fruit. If one fig is rotting, chances are good that other figs on that tree are also infected. And the point that Jesus is making is that a false teacher is discovered by the examination of the fruit of his ministry. And this examination has to be careful and in-depth. One rotten fig does not mean the entire tree is bad. 
Likewise, every pastor, preacher, or teacher will have some who sit under their ministry who are rotten fruits in one way or another. The question is not if there are some people in a church or in a ministry who show little sign at God's grace and work at God's grace at work in their life. The question is, is there a general pattern of gracelessness, selfishness, or divisiveness in the preacher's followers? One fruit may be bad, and that bad fruit should cause us to examine other fruits. But we should recognize that one fruit may not reflect the entire condition of the tree. But if the, much of the fruit is bad, then one must question the health of the tree. So we have to look at the fruit of the ministry of a false teacher. And just so you know, that is not the number of professions of faith made or the number of people who attend the service. Those can certainly be false professions and you can have a church and a congregation full of graceless members. We have to look at the biblical fruits and these differences can be summarized as the differences between the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. In 2 Peter chapter 2, in the book of Jude, offered descriptions of false teachers and the fruits of their ministry, which helped us identify wolves in the fold and rottenness in the tree. So let me give you a few of them. This is not all of them. But one evidence of rot is greed. If a preacher attempts to persuade his audience with promises of wealth, houses, cars, and possessions, then he is appealing to your greed. If he starts going on and on about seed money that will grow into hundreds or thousands of times more than you, than you planted, he is a false teacher. If he spends his time talking about his private jet, his designer shoes, and his European sports car, and he tells you that if you have enough faith, you can have the same thing too, he is a false teacher. He is appealing to your greed. And he should not be believed because his ministry is rotten. Another mark, very closely related to the first, maybe a little bit more general, is if the minister appeals to the flesh by promising you pleasure and the satisfaction of your desires, then he's a false teacher. So at the fruit of the ministry, if you see the people under his ministry and you find that they are bent on the satisfaction of their own desires, that's evidence of rotten fruit. If the ministry grows by appealing to the desires of the flesh, if it targets those desires, that is a mark of a false preacher and a false ministry. If there is no call to forsake sin, to put to death the old nature, to deny self and to humble yourself, then it is a mark of a false teacher. If the fruit of the ministry shows a lack of humility, an unwillingness to sacrifice for others, and a lack of service to others, then that is a sign that the leadership of that ministry is predatory. A self, a flesh-centered, self-gratifying ministry is rotten. One of the clearest signs of a false teacher is pride. One who is habitually self-willed, who demands it is my way or the highway, who cannot be questioned, and who demands that he it believes that he is due all the respect of others, is a false teacher. Likewise, one who refuses to treat others respectfully, who talks at great length about being equal and about not, not having any authority over anybody else, He's a false teacher. Both are driven by pride. Both cannot stand to see another lifted up, and so they seek to promote themselves. Instead of submitting to biblical leadership, instead of submitting to the biblical models, they've rejected it all. 
one who works behind the scenes to persuade others to take his side in a manner creates division in the church and is a false teacher. One who refuses to submit to the biblical leadership structure in the church, whether it be the refusal of the church to submit to the pastor or the refusal of the pastor to submit to the church. If they're refusing the biblical, biblical polity, it's a, it is a mark of a false teacher. He's lifted up with pride. The same pride is manifested by a self-will, which pursues personal desires rather than God's desires. So the preacher who does what he wants with no concern for what God says, what God wants, or how what he does affects the congregation is a false teacher. The congregation that is marked by a pursuit of whatever some individual wants with no regard to God's word or the thoughts of others is also the fruit of a false teacher. So that when business meetings become battlefields in which opposing parties fight to convince everyone to do what they think should be done, you can be certain there's a wolf somewhere in the flock. One final mark of an evil teacher is empty teaching. The false teacher will speak high-sounding words. He will say many impressive-sounding things. Will tell stirring stories. Will make you laugh and cry. But in the final evaluation, will say little of any substance. So the regular attenders of the church will have little biblical knowledge. Will rarely learn anything new about Scripture. And will not be challenged to apply the word in ways they had not previously considered. A false teacher serves whipped cream to his hearers every week. Instead of giving them a balanced diet of the full milk and meat of scripture. If a preacher does not teach. And if the hearers do not learn. There's a sure mark of a false teacher. So evaluate every preacher, every teacher, on the fruit of their teaching. And this raises one of the great problems with radio, television, and internet ministries. You can evaluate the content of the message. You can usually discern if they're preaching biblical content or not. But it is frequently quite difficult to evaluate the fruit of that message. So you will likely never see the preacher in person. You'll never sit down and have a cup of coffee with him. You probably will never attend this church. If you do, you probably won't participate in a business meeting or see how those in his church resolve conflict. You cannot watch an online service and determine if the church is growing in love and grace. I'm not against online ministries. We have one here. I am saying, though, be doubly cautious with ministries and ministers who you only see on a screen. And we need to be aware of false teachers because their end is destruction. And those who follow them risk the same fate. Look at verse 19. Jesus says, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down. And thrown into the fire. Again, 2 Peter warns that false teachers bring in destructive errors which enslave the hearers. False teachers are not just well intentioned but mistaken, they are predators whose errors bring judgment to themselves and their hearers. And we have to be wary because eternal. Issues are at stake. Both eternal salvation in some cases and eternal reward in many others. One of the responsibilities given to me as a pastor is to guard the flock, this particular flock, from these wolves. 
Now, the widespread access to teachers of all kinds makes it impossible for me to protect you from all false teachers. I should and I do restrict who preaches and teaches in this church. I cannot and I should not restrict who you read or watch or listen to. I can warn you, and I do warn you, beware of false prophets. Be very wary. Do not accept anyone simply because he is popular, because you like the way he talks, or because you like the musicians on his show. Evaluate the life, doctrine, and fruit of every teacher. And these marks of the false teachers I've mentioned, they'll help guide you in that process. I will say as well, if you're uncertain about someone or something that is taught, ask me. I I like answering those kinds of questions. I don't know every teacher and preacher that's out there. I don't know every doctrine that's out there. But usually I can find out who a person is or what a teaching is relatively quickly. But you cannot rely upon me or any other person to protect you entirely from false teachers. You must be on guard for yourself. And the first and most important defense is for you to carefully study the Word of God under the guidance of godly teachers. And so what I mean is that you must study the Word for yourself. You must read and dig into the Bible on your own. Study Memorize, meditate, outline, define, summarize, and paraphrase Scripture. Do some hard work to reach conclusions and resolve difficulties in your understanding. Study the Word, but do not do so in isolation. We have 2,000 years of church history of faithful men and women who have studied the Word of God who have, by God's grace and through His ability, worked out many of these things. And so that as you go to the Word of God, do not uh, just accept your understanding. Check it. Check it with somebody else's. I do that every single week. It's one of the reasons I read commentators and books as I do, is to make sure that I'm not just going off on some tangent on my own. And if I ever come up to you and say, I've discovered this new truth that nobody's ever seen in the Word before, Just stop me there and say, you're wrong. Because I am, I can tell you. And so as you study the Word of God, go back to others and check your understanding against the teaching of those who have shown themselves to be faithful. Don't trust your feelings. This feels right. It must be okay. Don't just trust your own conclusion. But rather seek the input of godly preachers, godly commentators, And I'll give you two. I highly recommend Charles Spurgeon and Matthew Henry. Start there. Great resources to help you along. And between the two of them, they've covered all the scriptures a couple times over. And and certainly, they're exhaustive resources there. So fill your mind with the Word of God. If you would beware of false prophets, fill your mind with the Word of God. Please, whatever you do, Do not fill your mind and heart with teaching from someone who distorts biblical truth or whose ministry consistently produces rotten fruit. Walk in the truth. Follow those who are faithful to the Word of God and whose ministries have proven to nourish the fruit of the Spirit in the lives of the hearers. Beware false prophets. Follow faithful men of God. Fill your mind with the Word of God. Let's end there. Lord, we, we thank you. Thank you that you've given us your Word and your Spirit, that even as we think of these things and we know that there are many deceivers that have gone out into the world, that they are teaching incredibly compelling and convincing lies. Yet we are not left to our own resources, our own intellect, our own studies, but you have enabled us and are enabling us through the power of your Spirit to understand the Word rightly. You have given us a church that we are part of to seek help, to to clarify our understanding the correct errors. 
And so, Lord, I pray that we will all be diligent. That we may set aside false teachers to follow the truth. That in our lives we might be fruitful to your eternal glory. That we might show those great virtues, that fruit of the Spirit. That men may see and glorify you. So continue to work in us through your word today. We pray this in your holy name. Amen.